so this really is an exploration um, in progress of, of building an ethical research culture. So the aim of the first part of this, which is the part that I'm going to uh, discuss today, was to move towards a better understanding of the experiences of people of a refugee background of being involved in research. So we carried this out uh, last year in 2022 through a series of discussions with people um, uh, who, who have been through or are still in the international protection process based in Ireland uh, and Scotland, and who had experience of being involved in research um, either as participants or as researchers themselves. So what emerged from these discussions was a document co-written by everyone involved outlining some ethical considerations when working with people of refugee background as participants. Um, it's on the second slide, sorry, forget that I'm not moving it myself. Um, uh, so ethical considerations when working with people of refugee background as participants in research. Um, and so these, I'll, I'll look at a few of these considerations today. Um, and the, I brought a few copies of the document so this is the co-written um piece if people want to look at it and we can we can look at it afterwards in our discussion um but just before i i go into some of the key considerations um just to give a sense of the second stage which we're working on uh now because i think it's very related to the theme of this um, this series of integration in the long term of refugees. So many of the people in the involved in the consultations and in co-writing this document uh, on ethical research were scholars themselves who were involved in refugee related research. So it became clear as the discussions evolved that we also needed to look at this aspect of participatory and collaborative research in more detail exploring the challenges and barriers to involvement for scholars of refugee background in refugee related research so this this is the piece that we're looking at at the moment again um, through a series of discussions with scholars based in ireland and scotland who have a refugee background themselves um, and there will be a webinar on the 27th of um, march on this so i will i will share details of that so back to the the considerations um, for ethical research. With this process um, and with all the people involved, we really wanted to have a discussion about ethics that was context based, so based on actual experiences. And we're obviously aware that there are several um, really useful and important uh, ethical codes or sets of guidelines that have been published uh, over the, the past few years in relation to working with displaced people. Uh, for example, the, the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration Code of Ethics, uh, the Canadian Council for Refugees uh, Code of Ethics, there's several really good pieces of work. So this work does not seek to replicate this, um, rather it's seeking to add to it by, could I have the, I think I'm on the next slide, um, to add to it by grounding a discussion of ethics really in the direct experiences of people um, who have been involved in research in recent years um, in order to generate a deeper understanding of people's experiences. So um, again, the considerations are not meant to be exhaustive. It's not one list and that's it. Um, it was a small group of people we worked with and we're also aware that other people of a refugee background in different um, geographical, social, political contexts may have very different perspectives and experiences. But the considerations are really based on the author's own very mixed experiences of involvement in research. So despite some very positive experiences, both as researchers and as participants, negative experiences centered around disempowerment um, and a sense of isolation that can come with not feeling in control of one's involvement in research and of how the information is used and the negative consequences of this. Um, so again, in outlining these considerations, the paper seeks to suggest ways in which the research might take a context based ethical approach where care and respect are to the fore, and which pave the way for, for an overall em empowering experience uh, for people of a refugee background who are involved. And just to just to kind of clarify by a context based approach to ethics. Um, 
I mean an approach to ethics which is based on the individuals involved and, the, and their particular situations and needs, and which is also based on the social, political and geographical context of the research. Um, and for me, this approach is very much based on a feminist ethics of care, which rather than being, if you jump a couple of slides, I think there's a quote that is, uh, no, sorry, back one. Uh, yeah, um, which rather, being, rather than being based on abstract, uh, abstract concepts such as justice and benevolence, um, a feminist ethics of care is focused around responsibility, relationships, context, and particularity. Um, and this is, this is a really useful approach for me, I think, when looking at ethics. Uh, so the paper is divided into three sections outlining some considerations for before, during and after data has been collected from people of uh, refugee background in research. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the points from here and you can download the paper um, uh, yeah, at, at this link, which I can, I'll share with Emilia and, and Marcia. And um, so I'm really just going to pick out a few key concepts. So if we jump to the next slide. Okay, so um, before gathering data, um, uh, participants suggested that we need to consider what it might be like for someone of a refugee background to take part in research, thinking about what, what are the benefits and what are the risks. For example, asking firstly, does this research really need to involve participants at all? Can the information be found another way? And this is connected to being aware of the risk of over-research and research fatigue for many people who are involved in multiple research projects and often don't see the, the impact or the results of it. It can, it can result in a kind of endless process of being a research participant uh, and not being nourished, I suppose, from it, not, not growing with it or having any benefits from it. Um, Considering how might the particular individual be impacted by recounting painful experiences, what might need to be put in place to avoid or support this? Um, are there any potential negative consequences of involvement for the individual or also for any family members in the host country or in the country of origin? So it's really balancing the importance, obviously, of involving refugee voices in research with ensuring that the research if it needs to involve participants happens in a considered sensitive and culturally appropriate way as well as in a way that's empowering and inclusive for all involved so really thinking how the research will also be of benefit to the, the participant before involving them um, many of the considerations for uh, before gathering data centered around informed consent and the complexities of this so there, there are several aspects of this but some examples might be providing time and space to people to decide whether they, they want to take part. So not putting pressure um, on somebody to take part, but actually just giving the space and the necessary information and ensuring that that information is uh, understood, what, whatever is needed to help um, understanding of it in order for people to make an empowered decision. I won't read all the quotes because I think that might um, take up all the, the 15 minutes but they're all in the document. Um, secondly, in terms of uh, informed consent, uh, being aware that motivations to take part in research may be complex. So people may feel unable to refuse taking part due to a sense of gratitude to being given safety in a host country. Um, <clears throat> maybe a hope that taking part will impact positively on, on the case. And I think that's really important that that's very clear with people taking part in research. Um, um, again, in relation to in, in informed consent, there needs to be clarity and transparency regarding all the elements of the research in order to, to take an informed decision of whether to take part. So information like how long will the research process take, when and where will interviews take place, how long will they take, what online platforms might be used. Um, when will the report uh, or publication um, emerge? Uh, is it likely that the data will be used by further uh, researchers or journalists? Um, also providing potential participants with interview questions or other material in advance can be really helpful. 
um, in making a decision to take part and arriving to the research feeling informed, I guess, and empowered. Also being aware <coughs> that um, clarity and explanation about the research may not only be about language, it's also about understanding context and background of the research. So just because there's an interpreter present or, or um, language may be slowed down or, uh, for understanding, it's not only about that, it's really sharing the context. So I think um, maybe thinking about what material might, might be shared in advance um, in order to share that context and, and clarify it. Um, yeah, thinking about ways of being more inclusive in the research process through, through sharing material in advance. Um, during gathering data, so this would be during, during interviews or, or whatever the format of um, data gathering is, um, is the participant happy to be identifiable? Um, it's something it, before also. Um, should identity be protected? It's a discussion that really needs to, to happen with the participant in detail. Um, what are the consequences of being identifiable for themselves and for their family? Um, particular consideration in relation to use of photographs. Um, several of the participants spoke often in the case of journalistic articles of being under pressure to, to be in a photograph on the spot and, the, and not being given the time in advance to consider, consider whether a photograph is appropriate for them, whether they want to be. Um, and that, that was very difficult for several people involved who often said yes, because they felt under pressure and then, then it, it sort of caused difficulty for them later. Um, in terms of respect and dignity and confidentiality, the importance of only asking questions directly related to the research. Uh, several people involved mentioned that they felt there was a sense of kind of voyeurism, I suppose, from their perspective of people asking too much. Too much. Um, for example, are questions about why a participant left their country of origin. Is that relevant for research on experiences in the host country? It may be, but it also may not be. So I think um, providing questions in advance can be one way around that also. Um, a need for a researcher or journalist to be um, reflexive in their research, aware of their own preconceived ideas about refugees and perhaps about the culture or the places they're coming from, constantly, constantly challenging one's own assumptions and biases. Um, that came up several times in the project, the kind of assumptions about them when they were involved uh, in research. Painting everyone with the same brush was one of the participants that said. Um, similar to what I was saying before about empowerment and rights, um, making every effort to, to empower participants when they're involved in the research process. So thinking about what that might be in the particular context. So knowing, knowing their rights in relation to research can be really helpful in advance. For, for example, um, that there's no obligation to take part. There's a right not to answer specific questions. There's a right to retract information afterwards. Um, I think that clarity and transparency in advance is also a, a form of empowerment and that inclusion in the context of research. Uh, being aware that, that um, people in a refugee circumstance may be feeling disempowered due, due to the vulnerability of the period. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody of, of a refugee background is vulnerable all the time. It's, it's being aware of certain points of vulnerability in the journey and what, what process of empowerment can help that. Um, awareness of mental health and trauma-informed uh, research, again, being aware of points of vulnerability and the effects of that um, uh, on the short term and the long term. So one of the participants described in detail how, how for him that trauma affected understanding and processing, and he was involved in quite a lot of um, research projects in his early days uh, of arrival in the host country, and how how the trauma he'd been through had such an effect on processing questions, on understanding, even though his English was very good, it wasn't about language, it was just about time to process. 
So I think the more awareness on that um, from the researcher obviously helps that. Um, cultural awareness, taking into account the cultural context of body language, cultural norms, gender relations, religious practices. So um, researchers informing themselves in advance about the cultures of the people they're working with, um, while at the same time not stereotyping. There's a, there's a balance there. There's an openness that, that obviously difference across cultures. Um, is is there too not everyone practices their culture in the same way but i think just aware of how body positioning use of hands eye contact um one one participant told us in her um interviews with the immigration services where she grew up in an african country if you look in the uh make eye contact with someone of authority it's seen as defiance um Whereas when she was going through her interview, she was told if she doesn't didn't make eye contact with the people doing the interview, she wouldn't be trusted and her story wouldn't be believed. So there's just such a, a, a balance there, I think, in, in cultural awareness. Um, translation and interpretation is obviously a huge and complex area, uh, which we discussed in a lot of detail. Translation can be both empowering and disempowering for various reasons. It, it gives voice and it takes voice. And um, I think it's, it's finding that balance. Um, it's important to give choice to the, to the participant if they need a translator to discuss what, what uh, type of translator might be helpful for them in terms of gender, uh, cultural background, dialect, um, origin. So talking to the participant about their their wishes in this, um, because that can make a, a big difference of how how discussions evolve. Um, Talking about qual the quality and training of an interpreter, especially if a specialist language is needed. Uh, often interpreters are brought in um, in, a, in a rush. I'm, I'm aware of this area as I was once an interpreter. And you're often kind of pulled in at the very last minute, not told what specialist language might be needed, not told the cultural context of the situation. Um, and so it's not easy for anybody on any side. It's not helpful. Um, after gathering data, um, the involvement of the research participant should not finish once the data or information has been gathered. And this, this was really important for, for everyone involved. It's really helpful for participants to be given time, support and translation if needed to engage with a draft of either a transcription of an interview or any written output, any publications where people are quoted. Um, for them to, to be able to retract any information or to correct anything uh, and to be part of the process. Uh, informing participants about research outputs and any impact of the research. And I think this is part of a process of um, thinking about research fatigue and avoiding that, um, that involvement to the, to the very end. Um, being aware that there are various motivations for taking part in research, so having a knowledge of the impact of a piece of research on policy or on refugees generally or on individual lives may help to prevent um, research fatigue. And then I think it's my, my last point is, is really uh, acknowledging the people who have helped to create new knowledge in a way that's appropriate to the context and situation. And I think this is it, it's so important. I think so often um, we can we can gather we can gather information from so many people in so many contact texts, but not acknowledge where that information has come from, unless somebody uh, has a name, a quotable name. And I think so many um, so much contribution is dropped along the way and not acknowledged um, because of this. There's a, a wonderful writer called Risha Nagar. People have come across her who talks about, I don't know the exact quote, but um, thinking about the people whose shoulders we stand on in terms of where all our knowledge is gleaned from. 
and just being really careful to acknowledge all those people. So that brings me to um, acknowledging the people who were involved in writing um, this document with me. Let's read their names. Um, so Ahmad Albatran, Shoki Al Dubai, Haidar Al Hashimi, Matida Nasi Beja, Neo Florence Gilson, Azad Izedin, Steve Kirkwood, Abdullah Mansare, Sharon Dalani Mapofu, Mirani Rahalik, Karen Smith, and Marwa Zamir. Um, so there are uh, a few copies of this around, which I can uh, leave here. And then the, the next phase that I mentioned of, of working with um, scholars uh, with refugee backgrounds, we will discuss in, in a webinar on Monday, the 27th of March, and I will pass around the link for that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Zoe. And please do share the information about the webinar. We will be happy to share with participants, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, we have another presenter, uh, Pinar. Uh, I think that people working in a kind of activist uh, refugee field may know Pinar very well. Um, so I don't think that you need a lot of introduction. Having said that, I will still uh, write, uh, read a very, very short um, introduction uh, about Pinar Bagrant. Um, so Pinar is a human rights and advocacy coordinator at Marihil Integration Network in Glasgow. She is a second year PhD student in, at uh, Glasgow uh, University and her research explores uh, art, and law in migration using art practices for social change and access to justice. As a um, human rights and advocacy coordinator, she is involved in several campaigns supporting refugees and asylum uh, seeking uh, seekers' rights. Uh, and these include, for example, right to work, our grades, not visa, uh, bus pass. Uh, Pinar is uh, involved in using a theater workshop grassroots organization and community campaigning as a method to raise awareness about asylum, refugee and immigration related issues. So I'm really pleased to have a Pinar uh, with us today. So over to you, Pinar. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. You. It's a bit weird when you can't see it, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you so much for inviting me over here. Um, you've pretty much introduced me. Um, I'll put an image of hat because I wear different hats. Um, but today I'm going to talk about more about when you're doing research with people who are in the asylum process or people who are seeking refuge, um, the different challenges that we've experienced, um, and also some of the research that we've done with partner organizations, um, and also some guidelines that we had drafted a few years ago as well. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm just in my second year of PhD as well. So I'm looking at art practices for social change and access to justice, what that means for people who are um, navigating the immigration process and at the, Glas at the University of Glasgow in the School of Education and School of Law. Um, I'll just move on briefly um, sorry, I'm moving very fast. Um, I'll just move on briefly. I wanted to show a brief description about kind of the history of migration and integration networks um, in Glasgow and in, across Scotland, uh, concentrating on early 2000s. Um, during that time in early 2000s, uh, there had been a lot of new arrivals coming to the country um, and Glasgow City Council was one of the dispersal cities. So it was a, that's, that's why one of the reasons um, people were being welcomed in Glasgow and a lot of networks then was started. Um, not just networks as well, it was a lot of using faith places as well and communities coming together provide, to provide different um, um, social activities for people. Um, so one of the places I work is Medical Integration Network, which was founded in 2001. And there was a lot of different networks across the city, as well as Scottish Refugee Council, um, and there are other campaigning organizations. And during, I think it was around 2014-15, some of the integration networks um, 
joined together and some of them uh, didn't exist anymore. Um, and some of them also changed names as well. Um, so some of the things that Maryhill Integration Network does and we do is um, it's a space and an integration um, network uh, to bring people who are in the asylum process, people who are uh, refugees, migrants, and working with the local community as well. Um, we do a lot of our projects based on community development approaches. So we design all the activities based on the needs of the people who come through the door. So whether that's uh, looking at their education experiences, so creating maybe ESOL classes, and um, creating different groups, such as women's group, men's group, um, and to create um, new projects as well, depending on the needs of the people and depending on, um, on what is available at the moment as well. So we use a lot of creative elements too. Um, have a, we've also got an art group. We do a lot of advocacy as well. So one of the group our coordinate is the Min Voices group, where we include people who are directly in the process in shaping some of the uh, campaigns and participating in policy making as well. Um, just moving on again, I wanted to highlight some of the problems that <laughs> is happening at the moment so that we are aware of the difficulties um, when carrying out research and also when approaching organizations to carry out to research involving people from asylum and refugee background. Um, because there is a lot of issues at the moment <laughs> that uh, organizations deal with, and these are just a few of them, <laughs> um, which is looking at detention centers, which is the immigration removal centers, uh, concerns around hotel accommodation, which is huge at the moment, which is ch changing the dynamic and the, and the field of work for organizations and for everyone where people are being now placed in hotels across the country uh, and in Scotland as well, um, which is again, changing the narrative about what is integration, how do we welcome people when you are placing people um, in a potentially uh, detention-like condition, as we call it, hotel detentions. Um, and uh, the other element, um, I just put it there as a bonus, <laughs> because it's very new, is the huge challenge that's going to, that is being imposed on us with the new illegal immigration bill. Literally, the name of the bill is called illegal. It's, again, a huge concern in terms of the language that is being used to describe people who are on the move. Um, and the impact this bill is having on people and also having on organizations. Um, uh, just before I start talking about this, um, on Tuesday evening when we were discussing with our Men Voices group about the um, new uh, bill that's being proposed, um, a lot of the people had concerns about if this is going to be a reality. And uh, we had the same discussion last year about the Nationality and Borders Act where people were saying, you know, surely this can't happen. And then it became an act. And now we have this new proposal. So it's the impact and the stress it adds on people um, is, is extremely huge. Um, in terms of what my experience and some of the things that I have encountered as, a, as a, a, someone who works in the community, but also somebody who's um, currently studying um, as well. So some of the... Um, examples of I would what I what we would call it as bad practice of in, in community research. Um, a lot of the time when we have researchers coming onto our organizations, um, they come with an, a theme that's already been developed or uh, an area that's already been developed in terms of the research area. So for example, somebody would come and say, I'm doing this research, I need X amount of participants. And when they come to us, we are like, well, we don't actually have the capacity, first of all. And secondly, this theme doesn't match with what we are doing. So it's not going to be relevant for us to support the research you are doing it. And I think another thing that I have experienced and I'm very much aware of it is, is the um, making a contact at very last minute. <laughs> so there's always deadlines in research funding and you try to find participants or you try to find a partner organization. And we sometimes get academics who contact us and say, I need, um, you know, I need a commitment from, this, from yourself if you can participate by the end of the week. It's like, well, that's not going to happen, <laughs> first of all. So, um, you know, having to be realistic about that. Um, 
yeah, I was going to mention, yeah, thank you. Um, again, um, if, if such examples happen, it, it, it has a huge, um, it, it breaks down the barrier with the trust with the academic or with the purpose of the research, and it could put off the organization to create that partnership, which could potentially be a good uh, partnership in the in the pro in the future. However, um, because of that lack of trust, it could um, it could not work in, in the yeah uh, for the future developments. I'll just go to the next one. Um, in terms of providing good uh, examples of good practice in community research, um, we had a few um, research where we participated, um, and when when researchers usually contact us in advance we we really appreciate that and it gives us time to have a meeting have a conversation about um what they are looking for and what we are looking for and exchanging that knowledge so for example if an organization is applying for a funding and it needs further evidence about um let's say the mental health the impact of um the well-being and the impact on mental health for people who are seeking asylum then we say we don't have a lot of data on this so we can work together um, with you to gather more data from the people that who come to the services um, and that way it's, it's a both-way process and we we develop that um, strategy together um, one of the things that we had done as well and um, uh, Gianluca who's here um, we used to work together at MIN um, we had created a guideline for researchers, and this was as a result of some of the bad practice we had seen. So we ended up creating a, a guideline for researchers. Now, when we have researchers come in and we go through the guideline of saying, this is what we're expecting from you. Um, and if you could have a read through the guidelines um, and we then have a contact person um, for the throughout of the research as well. Um, I'll just move on. So another example of this was when we collaborated with some researchers from the University of Glasgow, um, and the research was called uh, Scotland in Lockdown. Um, it was perfect timing for us because they were analysing and looking at the impact of lockdown, especially for the migration population. Um, and when we had an initial meeting with them, we openly said, these are the barriers we're having, you know, such as uh, digital equipment, not having access to data. Uh, there are underlying concerns that we have not seen it before, but it's coming up due to the lockdown. Um, and when we participated in this research, it was, um, it was such a good process because we collaborated together. Um, and also we informed our members as well. We invited to see who's keen to share their experience. And as a result of this, we were able to, we were able to um, publish a report together and we were able to participate in the written of the report as well, um, which I think was such a good example of um, how, uh, how it could be done together. Um, another example is, um, it's a slight example, but also some of, one of the campaign we're doing um, is it's called Our Grades Not Visas, Access to Education. Um, and for this one, we didn't necessarily work with researchers, but we created the data and we worked with uh, a student. Um, and I think there's a copy of a survey that we had conducted on the table as well, if you want to have a look. And we also worked with um, Gianluca as well, who stepped in, who's someone who has worked in the field and who is now doing research as well. Um, so the beauty side of this was that we involved, the, we involved Ahmed, who's the young student leading the campaign on our grades, not visas. And then we involved um, the members we have at Medical Integration Network and others as well who uh, conducted the survey. And we involved somebody who's um, doing research. Um, and while we were writing up and uh, creating the campaign, um, it was a it was a process that everybody participated uh, in the in the final um, report of the survey. So I'm aware of time, so I'm going to run through some of the um, key things in terms of how to do um, in terms of ideas for progressive research practices and in three categories. The first one is for community organisations, um, like Zoe mentioned as well. Um, that, that building that relationship at the beginning of a research is extremely important. Um, and people that you are involved with, so that's if that's the participants, um, 
making sure that and looking at areas of how they could be involved and what capacity they could be involved, whether that's in the drafting of the research or whether that's in the writing up of the research. Um, and as a result of this, it's, it, the process becomes more ethical in terms of um, people's direct experiences are at the center of the um, research. And also they're aware of what's being done. So one of the things we also do is um, we, uh, when, the, when we do, let's say we participate in a research, we also have a launch event at the organization so that people come along and see um, that this was where the data went and this is how it was used um, and also provide a final report, um, whether it's a report form or in, in whatever form it is um, to provide to the people. Uh, in terms of um, for academic departments and researchers, uh, we encourage the organizations and potentially participants uh, to be offers in their own research. Obviously, if they want to be or if they could, they, for them, for their names to be included, um, but for the organizations uh, to be cr credited in the, in the piece of research as well. Um, and that could be in the way of uh, authorship or that could be in the way of in the thank you pages um, as well. Um, again, what Zoe mentioned um, earlier as well, um, in this way it empowers the organizations to trust researchers to take part in it. Um, and it also empowers the participants to learn about the importance of um, research as well. Um, and for the community members, so community members are uh, for people who are seeking asylum and refuge. Um, when they are, uh, when they participate um, in research, for them to be supported, for them to make sure that they understand the, the, the purpose of the research, why they are uh, participating in it. Um, and similarly for their names to be included if they want, um, if they want that to be a possibility. Um, and it provides skills and opportunities for some people as well. If they, if they want to proceed maybe later on in their life, if they want to be in academics or if they want to do research, um, it provides the opportunity for them to participate and learn about the process of it. Um, one of the examples for this is we are doing um, a project with Poverty Alliance at the moment. Uh, it's, it's called Rights in Action. Um, Sorry, I think that was, oh, before, yeah. I put it on this one, but it's not up there. It's okay. Um, it's just the one line. Um, so it's a project called Rights in Action um, with Poverty Alliance. Uh, and what we've done is we um, identified and we uh, opened up to the community about the, the possibility of them being community researchers and four people signed up um, for this opportunity. And Poverty Alliance provided um, trainings in terms of how to conduct research, how to collect data, how to analyze the data, um, uh, and how to take it forward, how, which theme to identify when they're doing the uh, research. And it's been an amazing process because we work directly with Poverty Alliance and we get feedback of how the workshops are going. And then the community researchers are getting professional training in, in terms of how to conduct uh, research um, and it's been quite amazing because they come to the groups and they present what's what they've been doing so far so they also share that learning um, as well with the rest of the uh, group members too um, so they're in the process of um, analyzing the data they've done um, and the area they've decided to concentrate is um, on well-being and mental health for people seeking asylum um, and the impact this has uh, on people. And um, I think they've used um, um, interviews and uh, pictures like photographs uh, to, to speak with people. And, uh, and another good thing with this was the four of the community researchers, they are involved in different groups. So some of them were like volunteers in other organizations, some of them go to college. Um, so they were able to collect a lot of data uh, by informing the other organizations and places that they volunteer uh, by saying this is what we're doing and it's really important if you want to participate this is how it will be done. Um, again in terms of 
valuing their time as well. This is something we discussed, how do we value their time? Um, and we made an, a, a partnership agreement with Poverty Alliance, which they've been able to support um, us and the community researchers um, in this process um, as well. So hopefully, I think the research, the research is going to be um, launched at the cross party group on migration at the Scottish Parliament in end of uh, May, we're looking to um, have a date, uh, date confirmed for that. Um, just moving on to yeah, conclusion. Um, we always see that there is a space for potential space for to join up um, with different researchers and to look at how uh, to make the research more ethical. Um, and also to put people's voices at the center that they're aware of what the research is being done and they're aware of their rights um, as well. Um, I think that was my last uh, slide. And on a personal, um, personal note, this is really, it's been a learning process for me as well, uh, in terms of when I'm carrying out my research, some of the things, elements that I'm looking into it. Um, and the importance of when you're doing the research in the field of migration, um, to respect the organization's time and how long it takes for an organization to get back to you. Um, as someone who deals with the researchers, but now a researcher as well, to recognize that. And um, for anyone who's doing research, it's, it's, it's quite a tough time at the moment because of the new changes in the legislations and with the new proposed bill, um, um, you know, respecting staff time and respecting the difficulties people are experiencing is something to be considered when you're conducting research with people in the asylum process. Um, I think I'll end up here. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Pinar. Uh, we have the final presenter, Leila. Um, Leila works here at the Queen Margaret University within the team of migration integration and social connection. Uh, she is anthropologist um, and her background is uh, working um, in the field of forced migration. Um, her research interest is uh, in social connection and the role of place in integration. And uh, Leila will um, walk us through her in-depth experience in different participatory uh, methodologies that uh, she uh, worked um, on. So over to you, Leila. Hi. Um so thank you to Pina and Zoe as well, and to um, Marcia and Emilia. It was, I'm glad I've gone last because now I can pick up on all their fantastic points. <laughs> um, but the, the first one was really Zoe talking about the, the feminist ethics of care. And um, I was really pleased to, to hear that and think, oh yes, that's, we can describe ourselves as really aligning to that kind of approach and, and very much being about listening and care in the way that we approach our, have approached our research. Um, and also uh, picking up on Pina, what I'm really gonna talk about to, to, today is around three research projects that I've been involved in. Sorry, I've got my back slightly to you, but I'm torn between looking at the screen and looking at you. Um, can you hear me okay? So yeah, I've been involved in a number of research projects here at IGHD, but um, I'm going to talk particularly around the three main ones I've been involved in and not go into too much detail. I'm happy to chat to anyone about the actual projects, but just tell you about some of the participatory methods that we've used in those um, in those projects and really about how our sort of collaborative partnership approach, but our research is very much practice based. So it's in partnership with Practice, practitioners. And um, so we've worked with the Scottish Refugee Council, we're currently working with the Scottish Refugee Council, Bridges Projects and Workers Education Association on a New Scots project. Um, and we previously have worked with Bernardo's and um, British Red Cross, thank you. I just took those slides out because I had so many slides. <laughs> um, across 10 different locations in the four devolved nations. And that was working with on their family reunion integration project. Um, so that was with uh, sponsors, the first arrived 
member of the family and then bringing the rest of the family um, partner and children over and then the project was helping them to settle in the UK. The one with Scottish Refugee Council Bridges and WEA is a holistic part of the holistic integration service that they've been running in different guises over a number of years and that's um, a lot of casework um, intervention to help support um, newly granted refugees to settle in Scotland, so that's Scotland based. And then the third project that I've worked on is with Freedom From Torture, and it was um, the Healing Neighbourhoods project that has come to an end now, but that was really about um, trying to help uh, survivors of torture, refugees and asylum seekers in Glasgow to, to communities locally. So that's just a bit of context there. But I also want to talk about how we've taken collaborative and participatory approaches to working both with the partners and with the research participants. So just a little bit of background for those who are not so familiar with Scotland. Um, but because in Scotland, uh, as I said, we've also worked across the UK, but Scotland is quite unique in that it's had its own government led refugee integration strategy. Oh, good, you did. I forgot that I'm looking at this and you're looking at that. Um, since 2014, and it's really got an emphasis in the strategy on a holistic approach to integration and partnership working in developing and implementing the strategy. Um, next slide, please. And I just wanted to pick up on the approach of that, which I feel we've tried to echo in our research quite a lot, which is around partnership and collaboration. Um, and you'll see I've to highlight tips and about shared understandings, achievements and relationships of trust. Now our work, if you go to the next slide, please, Marcia, is very much about social connectedness um, and understanding the relationships and how they, uh, that people have with both individuals and organizations and how that helps people to settle in the UK or the lack of relationships perhaps hinders their integration journeys. Um, and if you press it again, but our particular focus is on um, the bonds, bridges and links. So we take a kind of social capital approach to looking at social connections. So this is the indicators of integration framework that um, our, our colleague, Alison Strang and Alistair Aja, and I was involved like 25 years back, um, maybe not as long as that, 20, 20, we're at 20, yeah, <laughs> thinking I'm older than I am. Um, we, we developed this conceptual framework for understanding what integration was about, and then um, by speaking to people in, in communities, both local residents and, um, and refugees and asylum seekers to understand what integration meant, and from there, it was commissioned by the Home Office at the time, and we developed this, they developed this framework called Indicators of Integration that was a way of measuring and understanding um, integration, and particularly focuses on the um, bonds, bridges, and links, this middle part around social connections, and that's been the focus of our work um, since then, really, uh, trying to understand more about that and how it connects because the, the framework very much says that understands that integration is multidimensional, multidirectional between lots of different actors and essentially about relationships. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So our, our approach to research is very much collaborative and action-based, um, experimental, dynamic and relational. And I love this quote that we've um, talked about in one of our reflective papers about it being a process of designing the plane while flying it. So we're doing it together and we're all experimenting and finding out at the same time. And we've um, borrowed from interpretative phenomenology approaches, which is really easy to say. Um, <laughs> um, but fundamentally, it's about trying to understand the whole story that people are telling you and in a case by case basis and then the patterns. And within that, we're very much um, we're very much um, advocates for a deep listening approach. Um, so really, giving that time and space, as Pinar said, 
people to tell their whole stories and taking the time to listen and reflect back what we've heard is what the meaning that they intended it. so it's not taking it away into a room and extracting the information and then presenting a nice shiny report but really within the interviews and all the research that we do checking back so I've understood this is what you're saying and um, so if you go to the next slide please um, so yeah, that's more uh, just what I've just said, that it's really the, the tools I'm going to talk you through are tools for dialogue and collaboration. They're ways of helping us to capture that whole story um, that people want to tell. And we're, um, we're very clear on um, being, being very certain about why we're asking what we're asking. So as Pina said, not just trying to find out people's whole stories in a kind of voyeuristic way, but being clear about what our research aims are and the questions that we want to answer through it. Um, so it's collaborative in that sense. We're not like uh, claiming to be fully participative in that people are helping us design the research from the beginning because we, we have tried that route in some cases, but uh, people are in crisis situations a lot of the time and actually and that's not... Um, feasible or desirable for a lot of people. And um, so it's partly pragmatic that we, um, we're we definitely working as much in partnership as possible, but we are deciding the research questions based on previous research and, and what we found out. Um, yeah, and we're just trying to foment dialogue, both with practitioners. So our research is very much in partnership with the service providers, as well as with the refugees and asylum seekers that we're talking to, um, to support this kind of co-production of knowledge. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so <laughs> I like this slide. I'm not sure it really fits here, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, just this is just to say that the research process um, is very messy and it is in dialogue and collaborative, and we are designing a plane while flying it. So those of you that know Roger Hargreaves and grew up on um, Mr. Men books and <laughs> will recognize Mr. Messy here. And if you go to the click again, um, this is Mr. Neat and Mr. Tidy who come along and. Uh, try and tidy him up and this is what you get when you tidy it up if you click again it's just a pink blob so actually a lot of the creativity and the joy in the research is the messy process yeah i made it fit okay if you go to the next one please um so i'm not going to go into too much detail about the three projects themselves and as i said happy to talk about those to anyone who's interested and you can also look on our lovely website that Marcus has um, designed if you go to Migration Integration Social Connections. Um, but the, the first project it, it, here, I took out these slides. So the first project was the one that we're currently working on with Refugee Council Bridges and WEA. Um, and sorry, no, it's not. First one was with uh, British Red Cross and Bernardo's with family reunion integration. And our original aim was partly to enrich caseworker refugee service user interaction. So the tools that we used were not just about extracting research, but about trying to help develop practice. And in the project we're currently working on, we've also learned that extracting knowledge and growing the knowledge base is not so easy or so useful in a lot of cases. So we've really focused more again on this collaboration. Um, and as I said, the holistic, oh, looks different from my, oh, okay, that's why. Yeah, there we go, <laughs> that's great. So the, the current project um, is all about integration planning and understanding people's individual goals and aspirations and their personal integration so, uh, journeys. So the tools that we're using are trying to help that conversation, facilitate that conversation in a very sort of reflective way. And the last project with um, Healing Neighbourhoods or Freedom from Torture was, there's no more red clever bits on that because I couldn't do it quickly on the last one. But um, that was really about, it was a, an evaluation or a review of the service and we wanted to really understand what the intended outcomes were from the perspective of refugees and asylum seekers, survivors of torture. Um, so we used participatory approaches to try and understand that more. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, so just now to the actual meat of the, the, the presentation, what we did. And one of the things that we've been developing over a number of years here um, in MISC is the social connections mapping tool or the SCMT, um, which is a methodology that Alison started years ago, um, along with another colleague, Una, and um, various people involved in along the way. Um, and we've been developing it in these projects in the last few years. But the aim of it really is to um, understand both quantity and quality of relationships that are important to refugees and asylum seekers. By refugees, I mean refugees and asylum seekers. So, um, but we're also hoping to use it more in understanding local communities as well in forthcoming research. So it's kind of two stages to it. And the first one is we do these uh, participatory social mapping workshops and we've been on tour with um, Chris with our family reunion project that we did with Bernardo's and British Red Cross. We went across the eight, then later it was 10 locations across the UK. That was a lot of fun. Um, just doing these participatory workshops and we've done it again in the um, New Scots project with the Scottish Refugee Council, Bridges and WEA. So um, I'll tell you a little bit, I'll show you some pictures and tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and the second part of it is then using those locally specific connections that are developed in these workshops um, when we ask uh, particular questions to elicit what connections are important. We then use those connections to feed into a survey that we've now got online. Um, and that then is to understand both the quantity of connections that people have and understand a bit more about their background and get a bit of demographic data, but also to understand a bit more about the patterns in how much people trust and have been able to offer reciprocal help to those connections. So looking at this kind of social capital perspective of trust and reciprocity as indicators of the strength of the relationship. So if you go to the next slide, please. So, and just click again, yeah. So um, as I said, these what we're trying to do in all our work is have holistic conversations. Um, and this is a quote from one of the integration advisors in a learning event that we did. So we've along the way been reflecting with practitioners about the research process and about their work and what's working, what isn't. And this is what they said about um, using the tools is that um, it was bringing them back to having these more holistic conversations with people and talking about their aspirations because there's so much effort spent on firefighting as there has to be um, with their clients, but it was nice to to have a tool to help them step back and have more holistic conversations again. If you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so also what we've learned a lot through our research is about those, sorry, what does that say? Five minutes. So we've also learned that um, the conversations need to be relevant to people and happen in context. Um, so there's no point having an abstract conversation about social connectedness when people are desperately trying to get house. Um, but if you, if we have conversations about who's helped you to get a house or who's helping you in employment, that can help move things further along for people. So pretty obvious when you say it, but um, that's been a good learning. If you go to the next slide, please. So here's some nice pictures now. This is the social connections mapping tool. This is a picture of one of the scenarios that we did in a, um, a social connections mapping workshop. So one of the questions, we asked three questions and they were, who would you speak to or go to for help if your hot water in the home wasn't working and um, your child was unhappy to elicit more of the sort of emotional connections as well as the practical ones. And if you were looking for work to get some more of those systemic connections. And in black, the, the fewer ones in black are, the responses that we got from refugees and asylum seekers that we spoke to. And then we spoke to practitioners to fill in some of those gaps of locally relevant organizations that could help people get into work. So if you go to the next slide, please. So um, this is an example from our lovely new glitzy social connection survey, which um, is a lot shorter and um, more user-friendly than it used to be. But you'll see here, we um, 
from all those connections in the workshop, we ask in the survey, which of those connections have you spoken to about, in this instance, we've got a survey specific to employability, about finding work um, since you had the right to work in the UK. So they can select from that list which one. And then from that list, we then ask, how much would you trust each of those connections? And you can choose from a little, um, a, a lot or not at all. And we don't ask it in this particular survey, but in some we then ask about the reciprocity angle and have you also had an opportunity to offer help to them. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to whiz through these. So this one is a picture that the map is then generated online. So an individual map that then advisors can then sit down with their client and discuss this map and say, oh, I can see you really um, trust a lot the ones in greens your friends and family but you really don't trust your um, staff at the, your children's school or your neighbours can you tell me a bit more about that and you know you look very connected to non-Scottish friends that one's um, got I think I'm looking at a different map for me no I'm not Scottish non-Scottish friends because that one's um, the nice pill colour which means that all it's all going on they've had contact they've had an opportunity to give help and they trust a lot. So if you go to, just skip the next slide, please. And then um, this is just an example of another tool that we've used in with the British Red Cross. And um, we were speaking to children and um, adults at the whole family unit. And we used, this is a coaching tool that I've used in my work that is about asking people to fill in the wheel according to how fulfilled they feel in each area of their life. And that's been a nice tool, both with children and with adults, to understand uh, and move around the wheel and check how they feel about each aspect to add this. You can see in this one, the child has added friendship as a, a category that's really important to them. And so that gives a bit more control over the conversation and a chance to reflect that. Go to the next slide. Um, Another, and just click again, yeah, another uh, tool that we've used with the Healing Neighbourhoods Project was participatory ranking workshops. And that was a really good way of interactively getting people to prioritise what outcomes they wanted to see from the project for themselves. And from these quotes that you can see here, the, the, the picture is they got to choose objects from around the room and that represented um, for example, the yellow ball was sunshine and somebody said when I first came to Healing Neighbourhoods Project, it seemed like there's no sunshine and the project helped me to see light and sunshine again. And from that, we developed a framework to evaluate the project based on what they thought was important. So if you go to the next slide. Um, We've also developed in line with our social connections mapping tool, another tool which uh, we borrowed from Pitaway at it all um, called Bullseye Ranking, where we ask people who has been important to helping you in your life in Scotland and then who has been most important. And that's another tool that we've used in having that discussion. And again, it's visual so people can see it and you can check in have I understood that right does this represent now looking at it what do you think you go to the next slide this one has been particularly useful tool for practitioners as well where we've then mapped the pathways from our in-depth interviews with people so all these tools are part and parcel but actually the full conversation is through an in-depth interview but from there we were able to map kind of people's journeys and the outcomes in the green stars like settled housing, improved English, um, and, and how which connections have helped them to get there. So that's been a really nice visual and practitioners, service providers have really liked that. If you go to the next slide, then you can just go to the next one. So I don't need to talk about that. Just finally, our colleague, Eric um, Dakesian is has been working on these network maps because he's a he does um, social network analysis and they're another really great way of mapping and describing the differential access and needs um, and great way to communicating back to service providers from this is taken from our social connection survey um, 
and understanding that understanding a bit more who has connections so the on the right it's the partner's connections and on the left it's the first arriving sponsor this is in a family reunion case so another good visual for representing it you go to the next slide i'm at the end here so a summary that's lucky we've used lots of different creative tools that's the summary and um uh yeah they've they helped they all help they're not the be all and end all but they're all tools to help these conversations to help a holistic conversation help us listen and reflect back and make sure that we've understood um people's priorities their outcomes what they want to tell us um, and that's really what i need to say about that if you go to the next slide um same thing really it's all their tools my husband hates this word tools and toolboxes because he's a furniture maker he says why is everyone talking about toolboxes <laughs> anyway i'm not going to say toolbox but they are tools that help us <laughs> um yeah and you know there are challenges in using these tools they all look great and we've had to really work to adapt them to make them succinct and user friendly and um not uh onerous to use and finally, just to say that, um, you know, there is a conversation that we're having and still to be had around how we translate the research or reflect, you know, we're creating all these spaces for reflection, but we need to talk about how, that, how we put that into action. And that's a huge part of the ethical responsibilities, how we disseminate that and create platforms for people to be heard and um, not just keeping it in these pretty reports with the pretty, pretty uh, visuals um so that's all our team listed there and a link to our website and uh, to me particularly thank you thank you thank you very much that was uh, a lot uh, for us to di uh, to digest um um if it's okay i would be Okay, we're for the presenters to share the presentation for the participants today, because I think that there was a lot of information uh, that I think that some of our participants online and here, including myself, would like to digest. Um, we have, we should have 20 minutes, but we have 10 minutes <laughs> uh, for questions uh, from, uh, from the audience, uh, both online and uh, here. Uh, our presenters. Um, I'm not sure uh, if Marcia, you you have any questions from the online uh, presenter, uh, online participants? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, do we have any questions from? Thank you. Um, my questions. That's a. I've got a couple of questions. I'll ask one for now for Leila because I just just heard from you. Um, sorry to use the word tools again, but do you think these tools, um, these kind of creative exercises that, that we carry out, do you think that they are fundamental because that's ultimately how people stimulate their sort of and and analyzing like participants? It's, it's how what they need to stimulate their own analysis of their lives, the reflection of their lives, and also their kind of problem solving skills as well. Is it kind of like a, do you see it as just a much more effective way than, I mean, for example, obviously surveys and, and, and quantitative data is useful, but um, do, do, you, do you see it as, as fundamental in, in actually allowing people to, to properly stimulate their imaginations? And... Sorry, Lena, you have to talk. Can I ask, sorry, Lena? Yes, because I have to Just to make it more inclusive for our <laughs> colleagues online as well. So I can be this mic with you guys and pass around when you answer. Thank and you. I can move along with you. Hi, Gianluca. Um, <laughs> thank you for your question. Yeah, no, I think I think they're really helpful and um I think they do stimulate discussion. I think there's a really important part to having a visual that in the sense of ownership as well, seeing what you've put down and not somebody scribbling on a pad. Um, and taking it away and extracting it. But you know, you can look at it and say, no, that's not what I said. And I very often 
misinterpreted not so much the meaning but more um you know you uh, misheard the names of places or, or whatever so it's great from that point of view because you can see it i think more fundamental is what zoe talked about in terms of the ethics of care and taking a deep listening approach and an approach to really caring about you know what people are telling you um being mindful of what you're asking and that you're taking their time and they're giving their time to speak to you. So I think that's most important, but yeah, the tools are really helpful in that collaborative discussion. That answer you. Before we go to another question on the room, we have a question online from Rosario. And just to tell the colleagues online that you're on the screen now. So Rosario Rizzo has a question for Soy. Yes, and Rosario is here with us. So, Rosario, if you want to ask your question, you're already online. Thank you for asking. Can Hi, you, thank you. Yourself? Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Rosario. Okay, thank you. Um, so my question is for Zoe, and thank you so much for your presentation. And I was very concerned, not concerned, but intrigued by how do we ensure that we're not kind of, re you know, prompting questions to re-victimize participants when they are telling their story that might be very painful for them. And sometimes they are telling the story and you're almost crying with them. Of course, you should not be doing that, but because it's so painful, um, how do you, what tools do you have as a researcher to kind of help participants not to go through that path? Um, and you as researcher, how you, prevent from the situation from happening. I don't know if I'm being clear in terms of my question. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think so. I, I, I think it connects with a kind of um, a, a trauma-informed research from what I'm kind of understanding. I guess um, uh, maybe as a researcher being, being uh, prepared for if you're knowing what questions you might be asking, what, what the consequences of it might be, but also perhaps the, the participant or the interviewee having those questions in advance also, so there's not surprises. And then also uh, kind of being prepared of what you're going into in terms of what supports might be needed. So lining those up in advance also. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe and um, Leila might be able to add to that, I think. Um, so one of the things, if we, with my hat on with the uh, with men, um, if we have uh, the researcher conducting uh, research and then they, if, if they worry that this is having a huge um, impact on the person, usually they can inform us um, and then we can talk with the person to see how they're feeling. Um, if needed, we sometimes contact um, like a counselling session or maybe refer them to an organisation. Obviously, this is like the extreme um, case. Um, I'm just looking at the right, next question. Um, I think it could be a potential something for the research uh, when you're applying for funding to look into it, maybe to put a budget aside for um, well-being or to put a budget aside so that when you're working with participants, if they say that there's a need, uh, maybe that service is available. It's not necessarily it could be used, but at least it's available and that people could be informed that it is available. I'm just thinking out loud something that could be very practical. Yeah. Add Thank that. You. I, I just think that for us, working with practitioners is so valuable in this because we can set up a safeguarding agreement from the start and we have a named person who, if anything does come up that's traumatic and people want to discuss that, we can then refer them back to their caseworker or, you know, when we're working with the family reunion project, they were families who were being supported by family support workers. So we had that direct line back and we had out of hours numbers and everything. But also I think just to say that in the research, being really clear at the beginning that you're, you don't need to speak about anything you don't want to. And when people have got upset, checking in whether they want to continue or you know, do you want to move on or do you want to end the interview, always making it clear that it's, it's up to them. They have control and say it's over it. 
Thank you so much for that question, Rosario, to our panelists. Just one more thing to say, because I know we have a lot of PhD researchers join us today, and maybe you don't work with an organization, so you might not have a budget to you know, generate these safeguarding policies. In those cases, I think it's also a good practice if you have a referral policy. So if someone you know, needs further support, you understand the context, and that could be a specific city, so you identify organizations that the people can refer, you can refer them you know, to seek further support when you might not be able to provide that support or you don't have the expertise of the relevant networks. So something to continue. We have another question in the chat from Shepard. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. You are welcome to do so. So, but if not, I can read this for Soy, but also for all our participants. In case of research fatigue, how valid are the results we obtain from the participants? Not sure that I understand <clears throat> that. Yeah, Shepard, you can unmute yourself if you want to go in a bit more in depth, because of course the fatigue necessarily might not impact on the validity research per se in the outcomes of the research, because it's asking about how you know might impact the validity of the results. Although they might not be necessarily associated, but if you want to talk about fatigue in general a little bit. I suppose as I understand research fatigue, it's that kind of sense of um often well often in my experience it's the same people involved in research a lot in particularly in ireland and i think it's probably similar here in small communities the same people are asked to do research because perhaps they're they're um uh, good speakers or they've been their community activists or um they're people who are interested in research but then it's research project after research project and i'm kind of never seeing the the results from it, um, never seeing the results for themselves or for their, their communities or on policy or being involved in any policy changes. And it just it's, it comes up again and again, just this sense of, of fatigue and just not wanting to be involved anymore and drained by it, I think. Um, so that's, you know, from conversations I've been having with, with scholars and with um, participants in research, it's, it's coming up more and more and kind of connected to that uh, the kind of usual suspects often involved in research and maybe kind of for researchers to think um beyond the usual suspects the people who are always involved in research um their aspect of that anything leila and pina that you want to add and just what you think about it just so that you know that um so you mentioned a lot of resources that come out like the international association of course but also there's an special issue from forced migration review on ethics. And one of the articles address also research fatigue. If you want to check it out, those ones are publicly available. Leila? Very quickly, the only thing that comes to mind is uh, less about it affecting the validity of research, but just more that people won't want to take part and you have trouble recruiting people, which is an issue, especially when people uh, in such desperate circumstances and in such a hostile environment and have other emergency needs to tend to rather than research. So I think that's that's more the issue and comes back to being very clear on why you're doing the research and then following up um, on using it in a practical, useful way to people. Um, I think uh, you both answered the question, but I was going to touch very briefly on something else. Um, also, one of the things that we get uh, when people contact us as researchers, sometimes when the organization says no, it does mean like do not contact <laughs> furthermore. I think that, that's another area that when researchers are contacting organizations is when they say this is not relevant to us or we do not have capacity to respect that um, answer and to say, you know, to respect it and, um, and maybe not to follow it up and it kind of relates that to think about the lack of trust that builds with the organization and also um yeah understanding that maybe community groups or people are experiencing or, or having going going through different things and when 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 they decline the interest in the research just acknowledging that that is the case and not following up maybe this is a rant but that's one of the things that we always constantly sometimes experience um, and it's something that needs to be, I think, respected and understood why that is the case. And maybe it could be searched into it in terms of why, why, yeah, why you should respect that space of um, groups um, to see to, for them when they say no, 
uh, in terms of participating and acknowledge that there's a wider systematic problem of the immigration system imposing on on people and the organization which makes them to say no because uh, it comes to time as well if you were to help five people in let's say in one hour then uh, one hour of interview you're going to pick helping five people rather than one hour of interview so for for that to be considered as well yeah very valid run so thank you for sharing it's been very necessary Emilia do we have time for maybe one more question from the room anyone want to Lydia yeah. and please introduce yourself Lydia Thank you very much, Lydia Danko from the Open University. So I have a question, um, kind of the opposite of the question Rosario asked. When a participant wants to share trauma with you as a researcher, um, how do you respond appropriately? Um, and how do you protect yourself from vicarious trauma? Uh, can we take, sorry guys, before you answer, because we are short of time, it's okay if I take another question, yeah, sure. so then you can choose which one you want to reply, is that okay? <laughs> sorry, my name is Akim Babatunde from Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. I'm a research student, my, this is my first year in the research program. My question is just about, uh, like, when you want to reward research participants, we know how complex it is to maybe have maybe young people who are asylum seekers, you want to ask them some questions and you are trying to avoid whatever you ask them not to be able to you traumatize them. In, if you like, you want to reward them, you want to like, okay, thank you for being a participant in this kind of research. What is kind of uh, ethical issue that that uh, a researcher need to put into consideration before going ahead with this piece? Thank you so much for those questions. So two questions for you there. Any last one? Only if you have time, just I wanted to ask a question about, about authorship, just to expand on that quickly. Um, it's a big topic, but what what's, uh, kind of concrete actions would you like to pursue in your own research for making authorship more representative, like Pinar was speaking about directly as well, but like you also spoke about Zoe? Um, yeah, because it's peer researchers, or how do you get names on papers, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no need to reply to all of you. Choose your question. Um, I'll answer the one about when, when we're working with, I think I'm, yeah, um, when we're working with uh, people and for their time. Um, so, as you know, people who are in the asylum process, they're not um, eligible for public funds. Um, so, we need to explore different ways of contributing and thanking people. So, one of the things that we if, if people are participating in a research is we do mention about whether if there's a uh, some form of um, funding in place to thank people for their time. Um, I mean, the simple answer is in the form of a voucher, but we want to move away from that where we want to find other options of thanking people. And that could be in a way of even inviting people to a seminar or even for people um, having an acknowledgement certificate or exploring different options uh, to to thank people to participate in in, um, in research. I mean, one of the things is um, uh, we're speaking with Poverty Alliances with the community researchers for them to be um, given a certificate to say that they have carried out these trainings, that they have carried out these uh, learned about these methods, um, and it could be added to their CVs um, so that in future, if people have received their papers and if they have right to work, they could be able to use this as evidence to. As a, as a way of qualification to say they have this experience and this skills in, in this field for now. So we need to, I think, look at beyond providing vouchers and beyond thanking people for their time and different ways that could impact on people in long term um, as well once they have they live to remain. And well, um, I don't think there's an easy answer. It depends if the people want to put their names there. I mean, sometimes people don't want their names to be no known as well. So it's also given the option whether they want to be called something else or they want to use another name. Um, and um, the good thing with this project that we're doing is where uh, people are called community researchers. And I think there's a, 
um, there's something in the term as well, whether if it's peer researchers, what does that mean? Whether it means community researchers, um, and also openly talking about this at the very beginning of the project with the people to see what they would like to be called, whether they want to be um, have the opportunity to be a co-author or they want to be just acknowledged in the form of thanking them. So I think just having that clear discussion and it's very open, you can say these are the, you know, what and this is what we can provide. I think that way, knowledge and your decide. Easier. Um, I'll leave. <laughs> um, thanks, Tina. Uh, no, I, actually, you've reminded me of lots of things. So, <laughs> um, just in terms of um, dealing with the trauma that comes out from interviewing people, I, I think. Um, well, for us, the support of your team is really important. And in our ethics application, we talk about debriefing with one another. And we do that very informally a lot of the time after an interview. Um, and that's really helpful. But um, but yes, there you may need more professional support, counselling, whatever, as a, as a result of people um, sharing traumatic events. Um, so that's just my quick answer to that one, but support from the team is really vital. Um, and also from practitioners who, 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 have, who have that. And with Bernardo's, we didn't need to use it, but they were psychologists and family support workers as well. So that option was there. Um, in terms of incentives and rewards, um, so yeah, as Pina said, in our research, what we've done, we haven't offered vouchers, but we have um, we have reimbursed for bus fares. In fact, having an all day bus pass is quite an incentive for people as well, because it's not just reimbursing, but it's a whole day's travel. And we also offer refreshments and try and offer enough to take home some refreshments as well. Part of it, as we're all about social connections, is providing a space to meet other people and make connections that are useful and also to learn a bit about new connections or organizations. So that's hopefully an incentive for people as well. Um, and we also will offer to, we, we did look into doing a community advisory, um, what's it called? CAB, community advisory something, board board that's what it is <laughs> but for various reasons we we couldn't do that partly because of pressures on the organization um primarily which is always an issue and trying to get peer volunteers but so if we'd gone down that route we were talking about certificates and stuff but I think one of the key incentives and I come back to it sort of links into Jan Luca's question as well about concrete actions um I don't know if it if this is what you were getting at in terms of authorship, but again, looking for spaces where you create a platform for people to have a voice, because that's the main incentive for people generally who we speak to is they want to share their stories and to have action and to influence policy primarily, but also practice. So um, we're talking now about as part of our dissemination events at the end of this year hopefully doing something maybe in the Scottish Parliament or you know really giving powerful platforms where people can come back and share their voices so it's not just us but be part of a panel discussing that so um, I think that's yeah I, I don't know if I said but another thing that we offer as an incentive is to provide job re to provide references that might help get employment. Thanks Leila. Um, yeah, I have loads of stuff coming up from that as well, but I'll, I'll just focus on a couple of them in terms of kind of rewarding participants. Um, I have felt really strongly in recent research that, that we've been doing that, that um, people's knowledge and experience and time really need to be valued, valued, full stop, but also um, valued in payment. But the university makes this extremely difficult. Um, so we have done over the last couple of years, we have really, because it's been a fundamental part of the work we've been doing on ethics, we've really tried to kind of battle the university system around this to allow people to um, sign on to the university system to get payment in a way you would for a, a one-off lecturing or hourly payment and so on. It's so difficult that 
it just leaves people in tears and it's not worth their time and energy. So we've ended up uh, using vouchers, which is right back to everything we didn't want to do because while it's very useful, uh, it's just not the right approach. Um, and I don't, I don't see why people shouldn't be being paid if they're, if they're providing experience and knowledge and time. So I'm still, it's an ongoing battle. I'll avoid a rant, but, um, and in terms of authorship and names on papers, it's also something um, we've been working on quite a lot. I've been, I struggle with the, the, the term peer researchers and a conversation I had recently with Pinar was really useful around kind of um, making that difference between peer researcher and community researcher, because uh, with the scholars we've been working with on recent projects, um, I sort of wonder why somebody who is an academic themselves is called a peer researcher on a project. You know, why aren't they in the sort of normal hierarchy of a you know research assistant or whatever the, the level is? A peer researcher sort of automatically makes somebody uh, a displaced person or a refugee or um, so that's that making that division between a peer researcher and a community researcher. I think it, it, it depends on what people actually want themselves for their career. If, the, if their career is to be an academic, then they should be treated as such and given the training and the, and the pathways to do that. And a community researcher then maybe allows for a training for a one-off project or a different type <coughs> of approach. Um, and in terms of kind of authorship and names on papers, I think it's really important for somebody who is wanting to be on an academic path. I think that's got to be acknowledged um, and I think slightly on the side to that um, names on papers and also quotation policy for for people write researchers writing papers quote you know who you quote and how and when is so political so it's kind of thinking about who we quote is it the kind of again the usual suspects or is it maybe other people who are doing really interesting work in the field and could be quoted um, which could help people's careers kind of move on. So yeah, it's all sort of connected points. Thank you very much. Uh, oh. We will break for, uh, we will just uh, have a break just now. Uh, um, I think that the coffee should be outside for us to uh, regenerate and refresh. Uh, and then we will have a um, workshop discussion. We all can gather together to actually to discuss some of the questions that we had in more details. Uh, there will be a workshop here <laughs> in, in person, but also we would like to have a workshop online. So um, uh, participants who actually join us online, uh, we we do invite you to take part um, uh, as, uh, as well. You, we will reconnect. Let me check actually our agenda. Uh, we should be reconnecting. Um, 